If you would, open your Bibles to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah the 8th chapter. For the high school students, yes, this sermon will answer some of the questions we're going to ask on Wednesday night, so you can be ready for that. The high school students are studying Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther this quarter in Wednesday night class, and so we've been asking them some questions, and we've struggle to find an opportunity for a sermon that directly dealt with Ezra and Nehemiah. And fortunately, last Sunday, Jacob mentioned all three books in his sermon, so that was a treat for us. Tonight, we're going to delve into Nehemiah, the eighth chapter, Lord willing. Brother Curtis would dearly like to be here and provide you the complimentary sermon to finish his thoughts on authority in the Bible But unfortunately, his pneumonia and his recovery from that prevents him from being here this evening. So, we're going to spend time in the book of Nehemiah. Just so you know, the elders have a list of four men that we call on for circumstances such as this, ready to go at the moment's notice in the event that someone has to fill in. As Jacob preaches throughout the year... We avail ourselves to several opportunities for other men to come and to preach for us as well. This past year, we had three men who came and preached special meetings for us, two gospel meetings and Young People's Weekend. During the summer, we had the summer series where 12 evangelists came and preached for us. And then along with that, we had three other evangelists that we brought in for the Friday night devotionals throughout the year. So if you add all those up, those are 18 men that assisted professionally Jacob this past year in preaching the gospel here. But what I want you to think about also in relation to that is, over the last two years, 19 men within this congregation have taken the opportunity to stand up here and preach a full-time, a full-length sermon for you. 19 men. Congregation of this size have 19 men who can stand up here and preach the gospel is something we should be thankful for and something that we are very appreciative of. And that's not all the men here who can do that. Lord willing, this spring we'll have three new faces up here. Two of our college students have agreed to preach this spring. We're looking forward to that. And one of our other young men who has been here quite a while has agreed to stand up here and preach. So I mention all that because I want you to know how appreciative it is from all these men for the attention you pay, for the response you give, for the encouragement you give when they stand up here and preach the Word of God, because they're nervous. This is a good group to preach in front of. This is a group that pays attention, and it's a group which will give you feedback concerning the things you've preached upon. What in the world does that have to do with Nehemiah the 8th chapter? Well, as we read here this evening, hopefully you'll make some connections, not only in terms of what we're talking about, but the number of individuals involved. Ryan read the first three verses. I'm going to read all eight verses of Nehemiah, beginning in verse 1. I'm going to read primarily from the King James, but there'll be a few changes to it. There's some better translations that'll be interspersed in there. And then there'll be something different that happens when we get to the names. And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate, that morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand, and all the people were eager to hear the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood, which had been made for the purpose, and beside him stood thirteen men. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, And all the people answered, Amen, Amen. And lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also another thirteen men 
and the Levites caused the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read in the book and the law of God distinctly. They gave sense and caused them to understand the reading. Now, as I read that, hopefully you notice some things that are very similar to what we do every Lord's Day. Jacob stands up here behind a pulpit of wood on a platform that's made for this purpose and delivers to us the Word of God. But hopefully you also noticed within that that it's not just Jacob's responsibility alone, but there are others to help and encourage that effort. We have many here who teach the Word of God. I mentioned earlier all the men we bring in to also help and complement the preaching we get here from week to week, as well as the men of this congregation which have engaged in that. Think about that. Think about the similarities from what happened several thousand years ago and what we do each week. We're going to examine three things this evening. We're going to examine this crowd, this group, We're going to examine the men that spoke and helped this group to understand the Word of God. And we're going to spend a little time talking about Ezra. And then the lesson will be yours. Notice in verse 3 what it says, And all the people were eager to hear the book of the law. Now your translation may say they were attentive. It literally means that their ear was towards the law. They paid attention. The law was important to them. Notice in verse 1 what it says they had asked for. They had asked Ezra to go get the book of the law and to read from it for them. Such motivation was something the Lord frequently encouraged of His individuals, of those who followed Him. Matthew 11, 15 says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew 13 and 9, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation. Beginning in Revelation 2 and verse 7. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. These are the words of Christ as recorded by the Apostle John. And if you go down through here, verse 7, verse 11 verse 17, verse 29, just in chapter 2, you go to all the same verses at the end of each church in chapter 3, and you'll see each and every time Christ says this to each of the seven churches, he that hath an ear, let him hear. What's our purpose for being here? Why do we assemble behind a pulpit of wood, Have someone such as Jacob come to preach to us. What's the purpose for that? For us to hear the word of God. For us to be attentive. So let's ask the question that goes along with that. Am I eager to hear the word of God? Think of the access that they had to the word of God. This may have been the first time several of them had ever heard it read. Most of them could not read. And certainly most of them, if not virtually all of them, had no access to a scroll that had the Word of God written on it. Contrast that with us today. How close is the Word of God to you on a daily basis? How accessible is it to you? How many translations can you pull up on your phone? Does our access to the Word of God aid us? or make us complacent when it comes to being eager to hear the Word of God. Think about these people and their hunger and desire to hear what it was that was to be preached to them. They stood up. Now, most commentators will tell you they probably stood up for most of the reading of the law out of deference to what was being read. Stood up from the morning till midday. What do you think, Jacob? You want him to stand up for your next sermon? Well, think about that. Think about the eagerness, the desire they had for the Word of God. And that's how it's described there. They were attentive to it. So, how eager am I for the Word of God? Well, you know where I'm going with this. 
starting next Sunday, we have a gospel meeting. The Word of God will be preached on Friday night for the college students, multiple times on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. So we can get a pretty good gauge, each of us, how eager I am to hear the Word of God regarding whether or not I'm going to be here. Wait a minute. I have to work. I'm at home sick. Remember this? We have a live stream. You can literally hear every sermon that every man preached this summer, that every man preached for a gospel meeting, every sermon that Jacob preaches, you can hear it whether you're here or you're in Hawaii or you're in Germany or you're wherever you want to be and you can hear it any time you want to because it's available to you. So now the question is, Did I listen to those sermons when I had something else that prevented me from being here? Do I listen to other sermons that are available for me? Think of all those men who have come and preached to us in the last few years. Think of all the sermons they have of the preaching of the Word of God that's sitting out there waiting for you to pull it up and listen to it while you're driving back and forth to Dallas or to Houston or to San Antonio or wherever you're driving to. Or you're sitting in the airport for three hours waiting on your flight. Now, here's a way to gauge how eager I am to hear the Word of God. Most of your phones have on it the capability of pulling up and seeing what you did the last week and the previous week and the week before that in regards to screen time. So you can get a gauge, literal, physical gauge, how much time you spend in the Word of God whether it's the Bible apps you use or whether it's, I guess you could count all of YouTube you watch for that, but what you think in terms of those things which you could track and say, how eager am I to listen to the Word of God? And I do all this and I'm asking these questions because I want us to put ourselves in the shoes of these individuals several thousand years ago and ask, Will it be said of me in the future, they were eager to hear the Word of God? Is that the example you're setting for the world around you? Is that the example you're setting for your family? Is that the example you're setting for others? That they indeed will see you're eager to hear the Word of God. Let's go to verse 8. The last verse we read. And this goes along also with verse 7. So they read the book in, read in the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And that's what it says in verse 7 as well. These men that were with Ezra, the Levites, and these other men that were there helped the people to understand what was being read. You see, the purpose of reading isn't simply to check off the chart we have to say, yeah, I read my passage for this week or whatever I'm using for a Bible reading program. That's important. We need to read in the Word of God. We need to spend time in the Word of God, but we need to strive to understand what's there. Truth is, that's Jacob's bread and butter, is helping us to understand what the passage means. That's where we see the real value. We can find lots of individuals who can stand up here and read the Word of God. We seek men out who have the ability to help us delve into what it means so that we can understand it and apply it to our life. In Acts, the 17th chapter, verses 10 and 11, we read of some individuals which we've talked about many times but strive for this idea of an understanding. And the brother immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether these things were so. They strive for the understanding. They strive for the benefit that comes from hearing the Word of God. All those passages we read about Christ encouraging the hearing of the Word of God, it wasn't just so it could be 
a sound on our ears. It was for the purpose of changing our hearts, changing our life, helping us to understand what God wants us to be like, helping us understand what God is like so we can strive to be like Him. It's an understanding of the Word of God. And those that were at Berea saw the importance of that, so they searched the Scriptures daily to see if that were so. I'm not going to give you a name, but I'm going to give you an example of a young lady in this congregation. When we had our congregational meeting in October and we said we're going to have a reading program next year, this year, just like we had in the previous year, she said, oh, I need to know what it is we're going to be reading because I want to get some other books to go along with it so I can study the reading that I'm reading. She was striving to understand it. That's the benefit of the things which Jacob puts on group me. That's the benefit of those things that are in commentaries or we hear from the sermons that we might listen to is that we might understand the Word of God and bring ourselves to the point where we can follow what the Lord wants us to do. Christ gave an example of this in John 5 and verse 39. He said to the Jews as he was talking to them, search the Scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, but they are they which testify of me. They are that which testify of me. It's not just that we read it and comprehend what's there. It's that it changes us. It gives us an understanding of God, an understanding of how we should live. Paul, in writing Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, we usually read verses 15 and to 17, but let's begin in verse 14. Paul says to Timothy, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And then from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Again, not the idea simply that I read it, but that I use it to change my life, that I use it for the purpose that God intends me to use it for. Again, let's ask the application. How can I know that I'm doing that? How can I benefit from that? Once again, we have a gospel meeting coming up. We're not going to just read the scriptures at the gospel meeting, but there'll be a discussion of what they need, a help for us to understand what's in there. What about the ladies' class on Wednesday morning? What about the Thursday night studies? What about the periodic studies that the young people have? Friday devotionals, the campus study. These are all ways for me to look at the Word of God and to gain understanding from it. To take advantage of of what's there, that I might be like these individuals back in the day of Nehemiah that strove to understand what the Word of God was and had those there that would help them. What about Ezra? How did Ezra come to this point? Why Ezra? Nehemiah has conducted himself in such a way that they were able to rebuild the walls And they're now ready to begin in earnest building the nation of Israel in the way that it should be as they've re-inhabited Jerusalem. And you'll see through the remaining chapters of the book of Nehemiah, there's going to be some reforms that come about. And the way in order to do that is to start with the law and understand what the law teaches. But why Ezra? Go back, if you will, to Ezra, the seventh chapter. One verse we want to read there, it's a familiar verse. A verse we should all think about and know as we strive to do God's will. Ezra 7 and verse 10. As Ezra's going about his commission, as he's about ready to go back from being in captivity, to take his role, here it is, and help ultimately of building of the temple. That's what it says in verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart 
to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Ezra knew what the purpose of the law was. It wasn't something just to be read, to be set on a shelf, to be, as the children of Israel had done once before, lost and not remembered, but yet it was something that was to involve their day-to-day life and how they were to live their life. And so that's why he set his self, his heart, to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. What's the condition of my heart? Am I open to hearing the word of God and what it says about me? What it says about my walk in life? What it says about mercy, as we talked about this morning? What it says about salvation? Am I prepared to understand, truly understand what the Word of God asks of me? What did Christ say? Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Christ has promised us that if we indeed hear and we seek to understand, we can find an understanding of His Word. And that will change our life. And it will lead us in the way that we should go. Ultimately, Israel failed. They rejected Christ when Christ came. Ultimately, they had the law setting before them, that which testified of Christ, and they failed to see it. They knew the law. They could quote the law to you. But unfortunately, many of them, the scribes and the Pharisees, could not apply the law to their individual life. And the story of Christ and his teaching here on earth shows that to us, of how they had the law before them, but it didn't change their life in the way it needed to. They had the law before them, and they didn't really understand what it meant. That's the challenge for us today. We have the Word of God. We have that which teaches us all things that we need to know. Do we hear it? Do we understand it? And more importantly, is our heart attuned such that we're willing to learn from it and accept it? Do you understand what the gospel call is? Have you obeyed the gospel call? Are you prepared for eternity? If you've not obeyed the gospel call and you want to be in a covenant relationship with God, we would be happy to open the Bible and study with you. If you know what you need to do to enter into that relationship, or if having done that, you have fallen or you need the prayers of this congregation 